Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. It's great to have you with me this morning, and I look forward to presenting to you how to differentiate through customer experience and share with you some of the myths, the truths, and the pitfalls that we've encountered in our, <clears throat> in our lifetime over this, uh, this, on this experience. So let's uh, go and have a look. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Peter Strokorp. I'm the CEO of a consulting firm with offices in uh, Australia and the USA. We've just, uh, this is a great announcement to make, we've just licensed um, our, our methodology to a US-based consulting firm. So if you're in the US or North American market, we are now locally available to you and uh, please contact me directly to find out more about how that can work. I've had 15 years or a bit more actually working for you know, large organizations like Sony, Canon 3M and CSC in both senior sales and marketing roles. And I've seen the whole time how sales and marketing talk more about each other than to each other in, in these organizations. And that's um, kind of prompted me to go out into business um, and uh, to start this uh, consulting firm of mine. So the, the next thing is that I'm a guest lecturer in the Executive MBA program at the Sydney Business School. So this is uh, the MBA for existing ex executives, and I've uh, taken it upon myself there to you know, basically help bring sales into the subject of the MBA because it talks about the MBA traditionally talks about you know HR and logistics and finance and you know, you know marketing but not really selling and selling really is where the majority of revenue comes from in, in, in organizations. And so why wouldn't you talk about sales? And, uh, and I know that um, there's a lot of organizations that uh, a lot of um, companies that think that the um, marketing function is more important than the sales function. But if you, if you look at where the rubber hits the road, it's not really the case. I am also a publisher on um, several LinkedIn groups, including the sales and marketing collaboration community. And I'm a blogger and international keynote speaker and uh, executive mentor and coach. So if you're interested in, in being coached or being mentored, uh, please let me know. And I'm, I've, I'm, I've published a book called The One Team Method, which talks about how your business teams can perform together as one high performing revenue team. And uh, we'll talk about that in some, some more detail in another webcast. And I've also been featured in World Class Magazine, Selling Power Magazine, and Marketing Magazine, and uh, my contact details are there. So let's just get started uh, with this presentation. And I just want to go back and just go to the traditional sales cycle. So this is where, you know, a sales rep has, has some targets to meet. They contact their sales uh, prospects. They find out whether they have a problem that they can solve. They demonstrate the capability to solve the problem. Then we negotiate and we hopefully make a sale. And then we start again, which is why we call this the, the sales cycle. Now, the reason I'm showing you the sales cycle is that selling has changed. And how has it changed? Well, we've, um, we've tried to follow the sales cycle and, and chase the customer. And, and uh, most organizations are still, still doing that. But sales have dropped off over recent times. And what, uh, what we're finding now is that doing tactical things like providing more sales training doesn't really have the same effect as it used to. You know, we, we, a lot of organizations uh, that I speak to, they go, oh, our salespeople are not selling enough. We need to give them more sales training. But the sales training is consists of you know them putting it uh, into a room for three days with a trainer to coach them at some new sales uh, or selling methodology and then they get uh, at the end of the three days they get a slap on the back and they get told now now use the new methodology and uh, good luck to you and and that's it so after three days of um, being trained they're then um, meant to be proficient at this uh, this new methodology by the way often the head of sales does not attend the sales training and the head of marketing certainly doesn't. And so the, they're not really sure what's being trained, but then a phenomenon that happens is the usual traditional standards, everybody knows it, change management curve, which, mean, which goes, things will get worse before they get better. 
but because the the sales management didn't participate in the sales training, they don't actually know what uh, what was um, being taught, and so they they then see things that uh, get uh, worse before they get better, and then they find that they go, oh my god, you're making my lumbus look bad, so let's get back to what you used to do before, and and of course the whole training has then has been done the tubes and there is a um, a, a german psychologist um, that lived in, in the last century actually two centuries ago called hermann ebbinghaus and he postulated that 87 percent of what you learn is forgotten within 30 days if it's not going to be reinforced so for god's sake if you run sales training follow it up with ongoing coaching and mentoring to to make sure it actually sticks and lasts the next uh, tactical method that we use is we say, oh, okay, we need to sell more. So if we have more sales reps, then we will sell more again. But it's pretty risky to hire new salespeople because you're not always going to get it right. And, of course, it's pretty costly as well because um, by the time that they've ramped up, they've cost you a pretty packet of money. And um, Forrester says it's about 60000 US dollars for the first six months, during which they're not um, you know, coming up to full, full speed. So, so it's it's a tricky thing just hiring more salespeople without really knowing um, who they are, what what they're going to do, and, and 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 how they're going to perform. The next popular thing is then more recently is that we say, ah, oh, well, we need more leads, we need more sales, so therefore we need more leads, and that means sticking more leads into this into our existing sales funnel, and uh, and we're actually running the risk of bugging our prospects to the point where they switch off altogether because they're getting bombarded with all these messages every day and they find that um, it's going to be um, a lot more leads in the, sorry, a lot more contacts in the top of the funnel don't necessarily translate to more sales at the bottom of the funnel, but all you do is potentially put your customers off from buying from you altogether and from listening to your messages altogether. And then there, there are other point solutions such as, you know, technologies that, uh, you know, the vendors want you to buy and, and they say, you know, just, just buy our license and uh, a miracle will occur. And it's just not the case, you know. It, it just doesn't happen. The, uh, they're just point solutions and they will not fix an underlying um, problem. So how can we move forward? <clears throat> and over the times, we focus on the selling side of things, which is kind of a natural response that you say okay the market is changing so we need to move with the market and provide different selling methodologies so we had you know in the 1970s we had um, brochure selling where it's basically we had here's a brochure would you like this product would you buy it then Neil Vacham came in in the 1980s with a spin selling and, and as you know spin selling stands for situation problem implication and need payoff and it's a methodology that says let's establish the needs and the pain points for the customer make them feel really strongly that they need to solve those pain points and then present them with our solution and then they'll buy from us. Now, that basic paradigm has not really moved much over the last uh, 30 years. And we've now gone to then to, to solution selling and, and value selling. And, and now, of course, we've got the challenger selling and uh, insight selling and uh, provocative and disruptive and consultative selling. And, and it all means basically the same thing, saying that um, let's, disrupt the customer's thinking with our insight and make sure that they buy from us in the process. So we've tried to adopt different sales methodologies to a problem where we're not selling enough. But the fundamental thing that has changed is actually that the buyers buy differently. So it's not really about us selling. It's really about how we can make the buyer buy from us and, and get noticed. And what do I mean when I say get noticed? Well, the buyer's journey says that it's now the buyer that's in charge. You know, the buyer senses some sort of requirement. Oh, I need a new car. They then go online and research what they can get. They don't come to us first thing and say, hey, what, what should I buy? They do their own research and they do it in their own time and they do it in their own uh, um, sources. They then discover their options and prices. They might check with uh, peer review groups or uh, independent reports. They then create a short list of uh, vendors that they would like to contact, and they're pretty sure of what they're going to pay because they've um, done their research on the pricing um, as well. And at that point, they then are ready to contact a vendor. Now, from a vendor's perspective, that's terrible because, of course, the 
buyer comes to us out of the blue, they're already armed with oodles of information about us, about our product or service, and they know exactly what our competitors are charging for a similar service or product. And so they're really limiting the, the vendor's ability to upsell, cross-sell, and to make a decent margin on uh, whatever they're selling. Now, I've, in, in previous webinars, pointed out that uh, there, we need a strong link between sales and marketing to make that effective because most of the time during the research phase, the buyer is actually spending in the online space. And in the online space, they will then discover who they want to talk to. So if marketing can't attract them to us and to our salespeople, then we, we are losing the race before it's even begun. But that's the subject of another sem uh, webinar. And, and, and I've titled that Collaboration Between Marketing and Sales, uh, Smarketing, and, and I've um, written a whole book about it, and you can contact me about that uh, separately. Now, what does that, all that look like from the vendor's perspective? Well, here we have the problem that the vendor uh, has a need, but uh, they may not be aware that we exist. And then through social media and content marketing, or sometimes called inbound marketing, we make ourselves visible online during the research phase of the buyer. So we say, look at me, look at me, look at me, while, while they're researching, and in the hope and, and uh, you know, the strategy says they will find us online and then they will contact us and they will buy from us, or at least we'll increase our chances that they'll find us and we'll increase our chances that they'll contact us and we'll increase our chances that they will buy from us. So we've got all these social media strategies happening just so that the buyer can notice us and we entice them to contact us. So that's content marketing and uh, social media marketing. But th there is a, a strange phenomenon happening now, namely that we have a whole bunch of companies trying to make themselves noticed in the buyer's journey during the research phase. And what happens is that we spend billions and billions and billions of dollars cumulatively to attract the buyer to us and to be visible to them. But there's this arms race going on whereby more and more buyers are now turning off these messages by protecting themselves with um, anti-advertising software, so ad avoidance software. So we've got this arms race going on where vendors are spending more to be noticed and consumers are spending more to be to avoid the, the messaging that we're getting. And, and so it's, it's a really strange time in, in, in marketing whereby, you know, we, we've, um, we've got this, yeah, what I call arms race going on where we spend out, outspending each other to, to get through and yet to avoid each other. So it's, it's a really, really weird um, situation. So... Why do we talk about customer experience and customer centricity? Well, if you look at all the different opportunities for competitive advantage, in the past, we used to go on lowest price. You know, we're the cheapest buy from us, we're the cheapest buy from us. But that doesn't really cut it anymore because now we're looking for value as buyers, we're looking for value. Then vendors used to go and say, well, we have the best features in our products. Look at our products, they're fantastic, they're fast, they're efficient, you know, they're, they, they, um, they work well, they're reliable. But people don't want to buy features anymore, they want to buy value. Then we said, okay, we're gonna differentiate ourselves through good service, you know, after market, after sales service, and we're gonna provide a, um, a, a great service experience so that uh, when something goes wrong, we fix it up for them. But if you put all that together and you, you want to create value for the customer and you want to make sure that the customer perceives it as, as value, then really we're talking about, uh, talking about providing a superior customer experience. And a su superior customer experience comes through customer centricity. And what does that mean? Well, if you look at what customer centricity actually stands for is to create a long lasting relationship with your customers, to fulfill your promise of purpose and vision, to have more engaged staff that are happier to work for your company because the customer is happy and uh, they're, they're treated well, 
Now, we want to not only create a superior customer experience, but we also want to advocate for our brand and for our thought leadership and, and, and stand for why people should um, buy from us as opposed to from our opposition. Of course, all that uh, wouldn't be anything if it didn't produce um, profits through increased uh, profitability, uh, productivity, and superior organizational performance. And it also makes the organization more adaptive to external disruptive change. So a whole bunch of benefits ensue from being customer-centric and having a customer-centric culture in the organization. And it's really summed up in one motto, and that is, what's best for the customer is best for the business. And when I go to my, my clients and I, I, I ask them one question, they often get this wrong. So the question is, what is your greatest asset? What in your organization is your greatest asset? And, you know, they might say our, our, our people, our service, our, um, our um, products are the best in the market. But really the answer is it's your customers. Your customers are your greatest asset. You look after your customers and they will buy more from you and you will attract new ones. Now, also, you will find that there is a financial benefit in being customer-centric. Now, here, here is a, um, a picture of the um, of a seven, seven years of performance of customer experience leaders versus laggards versus the S&P 500 um, over, like I said, a seven-year period. And you find that in terms of stock market performance, the um, purple field here is the, the purple column is the average SAP 500 index. And you can see that the, those organizations with a clear customer experience focus outperform the index by some margin, quite some margin. But even more telling is that the customer experience laggards, so those that are not following a customer experience strategy, are falling way, way, way behind even the average index of the S&P 500 over the last seven years. So it's, it's a quite phenomenal contrast in terms of financial success of an organization if they have a customer-centric culture. Now, if we look at what, the, what outcomes does customer centricity drive, then you'll find that if we start with a customer-centric behavior and provide a good customer experience that will evolve over time and then improve over time, it will lead to customer satisfaction, advocacy, and repeat business from the customers. And that in turn will provide us with sustainable growth, profitability and productivity. New, the success of new products being introduced to the market will be much greater. The barriers to entry will be lower. And we have, internally speaking, a much happier workforce that is advocating for our business and for our customers. So again, multiple benefits coming through superior customer experience. And that is the reason that in 2015, Gartner said that in, by the end of 2016, so this year, a whopping 89% of marketers expect to be using customer experience to beat their competitors. So we're going to compete on customer experience. 89% of CMOs in 2015 said that's our plan for 2016. Now that's all great that they're saying that, but what they're not saying is that customer experience is easy. You know, it is not easy. So the myth of the CMO leaning back in his chair there with his arms behind his head going, ah, oh, that's my job done, is just a fallacy, and I'll, I'll talk to you about why. Let's uh, have a look at some stats. We'll, we'll have a little bit of fun with this. These are customer experience stats from around the world. Now, if you just have a think about in your own time, what is the probability of selling to a new prospect And the answer is it's uh, between 5 and 20%. Are you likely to sell to a new prospect? So that means between 20 and 5 out of 100 leads, you will actually convert to a sale if they're a new prospect. Now, what does it look like when we look at reselling something to an existing customer? And you can probably guess the answer. It's much higher, you know between uh, t around two-thirds of likelihood of selling to a new customer and repeat business. 
So you look after your existing customers and you're going to get uh, much greater success than trying to win new customers all the time. So look after your existing customers because it's much more um, productive and cost effective. Now, let's have some fun here with these stats. 80% of companies say they deliver a superior customer service. So this was a survey by IBM and Lee Resources asking CEOs of um, major organizations saying, does your company provide a superior customer service? And 80% of the CEOs said, yes, we do. Now have a guess of how many of their customers actually agree with the CEO statement. Here we go. One tenth of customers agree with the CEO saying that their organization is providing a superior customer service. Can you see how much of a gap there is and a disconnect between the coal face, between the, the, you know, what's happening at the customer level and the CEO's corner office? It's a tenfold disconnect and gap. Next one. This is probably more from the world of B2C, so consumer selling. How many buying experiences are based on how the customer feels they are being treated? How they subjectively feel how they're being treated, according to McKinsey? And the answer is 70% of buying experiences are based on how the customer feels. Now, I actually slightly disagree with this number because I think it should be 100% because we always have some emotion about how we're being treated or how we're selling, how we're being sold to and what we're buying. But that's what uh, McKinsey says, 70%. Now, here's my favorite one. A typical business hears from how many of its dissatisfied customers. So let's say you go into a coffee shop and you buy a cup of coffee and you don't like the coffee. How many of you would actually go and tell the waiter or the waitress that the coffee is lousy and ask for another one? Well, according to Ruby Newell Legner, only, drum roll, 4% of dissatisfied customers tell you that they're unhappy with your business. Turn that around and it means a whopping 96% of your customers will just slink away, just quietly walk away and never come back and probably tell 10 or 15 others that your coffee is not good. Right? So this is why customer experience is so important that if you don't know that they're dissatisfied, you can lose 96% of your business practically overnight. You know, have a look at this figure. 4% of dissatisfied customers will tell you that they're unhappy. 96% will not tell you and just never come back and never buy from you again. That should keep uh, any CEO or CFO awake all night long. Now, the last one is how many consumers have bailed on a transaction or not made an intended purchase because of a poor service experience? You know, um, I, in my talks, I often talk about telcos and, and their, their service experience. Uh, this is American Express uh, running the survey saying how many consumers have not concluded a transaction? And you would guess that the number is high and it's, it's nearly 80%. You know. Uh, and I'm actually surprised it's not closer to 100% because customer service is so important these days and, and it's so competitive out there that we just really cannot afford to have unhappy and disgruntled customers. I just re really quickly want to talk about uh, Peter Bertels. So he's the CEO of um, a, a company called Super Retail Group and they have several brands that uh, in, in retail stores. And he was saying in, in a presentation that our customers are not our biggest focus right now. Now, interestingly, that presentation was made at the Customer Excellence Awards Gala Night in Melbourne in Australia. And he said his opening statement in his keynote speech to the Customer Retail Excellence Awards audience was, our customers are not our greatest um, focus. Now, he floored the audience. Can you imagine the reaction in the room? They're, they're all there for customer awards, excellence awards, and he says it's, it's, they're not important to us. But then he qualified it by saying that my organization is not ready to respond to the feedback that we're getting from customers. What we're looking to do is to actually unite our own people first so that they can be customer focused and have the right attitude and the right mindset first before we go out to the customer and tell them that we're providing a superior customer experience because we're just will not be in a position to do that. So I've, I've used the examples of sales and marketing here, but you can use any two business teams. 
if if any one of your divisions, any one of your departments, talks to customers, interacts with customers, advertises to customers, markets to customers, sells to customers, and they're not talking to each other, you can just imagine what confusion and uh, disconnect will happen at the customer end when they get multiple messages from different people in the organization with different meanings and different results. So it, it's a bad picture. We've got to get the people to talk to each other and to align and to have a 360 degree customer focus, as I call it, because then everybody wins. Your teams win, your organization wins, and your customers win because they get a much nicer customer experience they're much happier buying from you and they will come back and buy more. It's just as simple as that. We've got to have that, that loop closed and we've got to have a 360 degree customer focus across all the different divisions in our organization. So what does that mean in practice though? I've now compiled here seven typical experience that a, any reasonable customer would expect from your organization, right? And the seven are all there. It's just making you feel important, you know, keep what you're promising, um, don't bring me any problems, bring me solutions. Make sure that I know that you care. Be fair and equitable. No sneaky tricks, no nasty surprises. Again, be fair. And if something goes wrong, be quick to act or react and don't keep me hanging. So there's seven pretty, you know, reasonable expectations that your customers have on you. But now have a look how difficult it is to implement those. So in the first column here, we've got those seven expectations. And across in the, um, in the, sorry, in the rows, we have the expectations. And in the columns, we have your, your business units. So we've got sales, we've got marketing, we've got your, your service team, and then we've got your back office operations, as, just as, as an example. And you can see that across the four silos, all to implement all those seven customer expectations would be pretty tricky. But now, if you look at drill down on, on that, you will find that each one of your vertical market, uh, each one of your vertical silos has processes, people and technology embedded in them. And if you then try to implement those seven customer promises across the four different back office silos, and then make sure that you integrate that with your people, your processes and your technologies, it becomes a pretty complex picture. See how small those squares get? That's a lot of balls in the air, a lot of juggling to be done. So it's not easy implementing customer experience into an organization. And that's why Peter Bertels said, we gotta get our people ready first. But why is he doing it? Well, because customer experience has deep financial impact. We saw that before in the SAP 500. Um, but a lot of organizations think customer experience is just a technology matter and we're just going to run a, a, throw a CRM tool at it or some marketing automation tool at it and that will solve our problem. Click. It does not. According to Accenture and CSR Insights, the adoption rate of um, users is less than 50%, which means the, the CRM will just not stand up to the business case that uh, you bought it on, on the basis of which you bought it in the first place. And even more damning, and fewer than 15% of organizations that implemented sales tools, you know, sales tools, that means technology, improved their win rates. 85% did not improve their win rate, even though they spent a lot of money on new technology. So be very careful that you don't think that technology will deliver a miracle alone. It's got to be people, process, and technology which basically, um, and of those three, we advocate very strongly and we find that in our experience, it gives you the best result if you start with the people first. Get their mindsets ready, get them to agree that they want to adopt a customer centricity policy and culture, then decide with the people in your organization how you want to do that, what are the processes that we're gonna follow, how we're gonna measure it, what are the metrics, what does success look like, and then, then implement the technology that supports all that. Don't do it the wrong way around. So getting the people ready is important, but how do you do that? How do you get them ready? And how do you know when they are ready? And how do you keep them there? We're gonna cover that next. Now, I just want to say, 
if you have any questions, please type them in now because I'll answer them during the course of this uh, this webcast. So if you have any questions right now, please type them in and uh, I'll, I'll address them. While I'll, in the meanwhile, I'll keep going. There's something called the Market Responsiveness Index, or MRI. And what it does is it helps you to understand how ready is my organization to even be customer centric and and how ready are we across eight different parameters so that we can actually measure uh, the level of readiness across eight different parameters both inward looking and outward looking in our organization in terms to getting that more customer acquisition and revenue growth into our organization. So we can actually now measure how ready are we before we start even offering a, a superior customer service, how ready are we to actually deliver on that internally? And it's very important that we do that. So here are two scores, one from a market uh, a customer centricity leader and one from a customer centricity laggard. Now, I don't need to tell you that the one on the right is the laggard and the one on the left is the leader. So you can see that out of a score between zero and 100% across those eight different uh, parameters, like, such as customer insight and um, um, uh, collaboration and uh, you know, um, competitor insight, we can see how prepared we are as an organization to even deliver a superior customer experience. And the one, clearly the one on the right has a lot more work to do than the one on the left. But unless you take the metric, you don't know, actually know where your organization sits and even worse, you don't know where the, pro the, the opportunities are and where the challenges are for you to become customer centric. So by measuring it, you can actually manage it. I apologize that the writing on the side is very small, but hopefully you can read it. But it basically says that the MRI identifies risks both short and long-term risks in your organization. And you've got them all listed there. And the result will show you where your risks are and how big the risks actually are in your organization so that you can then make a decision on prioritization of how you want to address the organization <clears throat> and how you want to get it ready to be customer-centric. So that's another outcome of the MRI. Now, who's using the MRI? Well, probably one of the most customer-focused organizations around the world is this one here, Amazon. And Jeff Bezos, we all know him, and we all know what he said. He said that I would be behind Amazon by our big ideas, which are customer centricity, i.e. putting the customer at the center of everything we do. Putting the customer at the center of everything we do. Now, imagine a multi-billion dollar organization like Amazon saying we are going to compete on customer centricity. You know, and they, when they came out with the idea of having drones deliver parcels, everybody thought they were crazy. But they thought it's a great customer service. Let's see how we can do it. You know, so putting the customer at the center of everything we do is a mantra for Amazon. And even as a, as a leader in customer centricity, Amazon still uses the MRI to make sure every year that they stay on top of their game and that they spot any challenges and gaps early and that they close them quickly. So the MRI helps them actually to quantify, to measure and to manage their customer centricity quality. But then once you have the MRI, your job doesn't stop because you now know where your challenges are and where your opportunities are inside the organization. And we advocate that the best thing for you to do next is to actually start with the two most customer facing teams and at the same time, the two most revenue producing teams in your organization. And we're talking about sales and marketing. Now I've mentioned marketing before. So this is sales and marketing becoming one high performing revenue team and no longer operating in separate silos. So, if you want to provide good customer centricity, a good place to start for you is actually your sales and your marketing teams because that's where the rubber hits the road and that's where your revenue comes in and that's where you get the greatest bang for your buck in the short term. Of course, you then have to branch it out to the other parts of the organization. So, so, so for example, like your, your back office, your finance and your customer service and, and call centers and so on. But the 
if you're asking me what's a good place to start, start with your sales and marketing teams, make sure that they're aligned, make sure that they're customer focused, make sure that they're customer centric and they actually live up to the promise that they're making. And at that top point, when you're ready to be customer centric and you're actually capable of delivering customer centricity to your customers, then you can go out and do your net promoter score or your customer satisfaction score. A lot of organizations go, oh, we want to be more customer focused. Let's do what everybody else does and let's ask them how we're doing. So we, let's go and jump onto the net promoter score. You know? But I can't tell you how many CEO, CEOs I talk to who say, well, we get the net promoter score number, but we don't know what to do with it, except say, oh, we want it to be better next year. So if you're a customer, imagine you're a customer. And I'm from an organization that's not ready to deliver on the customer experience. And I ask your opinion, say, hey, Mr. Customer or Mrs. Customer, what do you think of us? Out of a you know, score of one to 10, what, how do you rate us? And how could we improve? And then I give you that information, but because the organization is not ready to respond to that feedback, nothing happens. So me as the customer, I've given you my feedback, you've asked me my opinion, I've given it, nothing happens. How do I feel about your organization now? How, how, how valued do I feel that my opinion is being listened to and heard? Exactly. Not very much. So for God's sake, don't start with the net promoter score first if your organization is not ready to respond to the feedback that your customers are giving you. The net promoter score absolutely has a place in this picture, but do not start with it first. Make sure your organization is ready first, implement it at your most revenue generating parts of the business and then test your customers and say, how are we doing and how can we do better by using tools like the net promoter score or, or, or customer sat index or whatever it is, right? So this is the sequence that we recommend you go down by. You go by it because this is actually one that more or less guarantees success. So I've um, gone through this uh, a bit more quickly than I expected. And I'll, I'll now open for questions. If you have any, please uh, feel free to ask your questions now. I'll just uh, stand by for a little while um, waiting for you to, to do that. In the meanwhile, I'll also say that um, there are links there to my personal email address. So you can reach out to me personally with your questions and queries. The, a link to the consulting, um, <laughs> consulting website um, where we're talking about smart healing and the, um, the MRI and uh, all sorts of other services that we offer. And to my personal website where um, you can reach me for speaking uh, and coaching and mentoring purposes and also you can have a look at, uh, at my book. So you've got three different ways to get in touch with me and I look forward to, to hearing from you. Now, um, if you are looking to get ready for your organ, uh, in your organization for 2017 to make a, an early start on a high, or you want to finish on a high in 2016, or you want to get your organization ready for a quick and early start and positive start in 2017, I've got a special offer on at the moment whereby I'll give you a free 15-minute online consultation where we talk about your revenue challenges and uh, I'll try to answer your questions and um, help you to improve the situation uh, in a free 15 minute call and if, it, uh, if we decide to take it further and uh, talk a bit longer so be it but uh, the offer is there for a free 15 minute call with me personally online to talk about your specific business challenges and uh, how we might be able to address them so please take me up on that offer because 2017 is just around the corner and we're not, um, we're not, we're not, we don't want you to start in 2017 going, oh, how can we improve now? So be proactive and uh, please feel free to get in touch with me now through any one of those three links and I'll be happy to hear from you and answer your questions. You can also purchase my book online. Um, go to either peterstruggleconsulting.com or peterstruggle.com. You'll find the links there or you can go directly to amazon.com and, uh, and, and buy it online there it's called the one team method now i'm still looking for some questions from you and uh, please feel free to ask them now i'll stay around for another five minutes or so and uh, i look forward to answering your questions um, um, as and when they come in 
Oh, and I also want to thank you for filling in the short survey that we did at the beginning of the uh, the webcast because we're going to actually take a bit of a finger of the pulse of the audience and and see how many of you are well progressed or not well progressed or haven't even started on your customer experience journey because it's important to us that we tweak and and modify the these presentations to suit you the audience because we want to be customer focused and customer centric as well and I want to provide good value to you as a bright info uh, a bright talk um, customer so looking forward to to working with you in the future and to see you in uh, future webcasts if you um, care to join them please feel free to ask your questions now and uh, I'll be happy to answer them Okay, John from San Francisco has asked a question. He's asked, how much is it? And uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. The question about the, uh, the MRI is that we charge per head. So you can start off with your executive leadership team or you can start with, your, um, with just one vertical market, if you like, or you can just do the whole organization as a, as an, in its entirety, if you like. But the MRI is uh, charged on a per capita, so per head basis, and uh, we're, t we're talking only about uh, you know a couple of hundred dollars per head potentially, depending on the number of participants in there. And for that, you get the entire market response index uh, across those seven or eight parameters, and you get uh, an exec a report and an executive review with your leadership team to help you interpret what the report says. So all that's included in, in there. As far as the one team method is concerned, we start off, it's a five step process. So this is the methodology to bring your sales and marketing teams together to be one high performing revenue team. It can be as short as um, six to 12 weeks and it starts out at $97 per person to, um, to assess um, where you're at today, to give you the report and to review the results with your executive team. So it can be very quick, it can be very expensive, but it can make a huge difference to your organization in a very short period of time. So please, um, if you're interested in that, get in touch and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about it. So thanks, Joe, for that, um, for that um, question there. That's um, a very good one and very important. I'm sure the rest of the audience enjoyed that one as well. Please keep your questions coming. I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, Sandy is asking, what vertical markets does this apply to? Do we specialize in any particular industry sectors? And the answer is it applies to all market sectors because the customer sits everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're B2B or B2C, whether you're in banking or finance or transport and logistics in energy, in IT, or in uh, even in the not-for-profit sector, we all have customers and we all want them to be satisfied and we all want them to buy from us again. So we have worked with organizations in all those vertical markets and we've had uh, great success within a very short period of time. And you can find, if you go to peterstrokeofconsulting.com forward slash testimonials, you will find a whole bunch of customers there telling us, telling you about their experience uh, with, uh, with the marketing, the one team method and the MRI. There's, there's one other question here about the, uh, the license that we've uh, issued to a, a US based consulting firm. So this, this um, organization is called Trafero Solutions. They're based in, in Dallas and Texas. Texas, but they they can provide uh, they they have a bunch of affiliated consultants who can provide the service nationally in the United States, and they can they're authorized to provide both the MRI and the one team method. And I'd be happy to put them in touch with you if you want want me to do that. But just uh, reach out and ask the question, and I'll be happy to connect you to and you can uh, talk to them directly and locally if you're in the United States. If you're in Asia or Europe, we are talking to 
licensees there as well at the moment. We haven't quite finalized that yet, but if you're uh, keen to know more about how the MRI and the one team method can be implemented successfully in your region, again, please reach out to me and we'll uh, sort you out and we'll help you to um, understand the opportunities and uh, benefits and costs, et cetera, all those details. So that's, um, that's just uh, easily done by getting in touch with us. All right, so let's see if there's any more questions here. Please keep asking. All right, it looks like we have answered all the questions that you have. So look, I thank you very much for participating in this webcast. I hope you got a lot of value out of it. Please do feel free to reach out if there's anything we can do for you, any questions we can answer. It's obligation free. We're not going to hassle you. We're not going to harass you. We just want to be able to provide a good customer service to you and to your teams and to your organization and to your customers. So with that, my name is Peter Strokop. I'm the CEO of Peter Strokop Consulting International, and I look forward to hearing from you or to seeing you in my next webcast. All the best now. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Bye-bye.